Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. And welcome to Turn the Page. I'm your host today, Jen, and I am here with an author that I am absolutely thrilled to be talking to. Uh, We did an event with him last summer for his debut, and now we are back to talk about his second book. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Joseph White, and I am the author of Hell Followed With Us and my new upcoming novel, The Spirit Bears Its Teeth. Uh, the Spirit Bears Its Teeth is a young adult horror novel set in London in the in 1883 about an autistic trans boy with violet eyes who gets sent to a cruel boarding school meant to turn him into the perfect wife, where he meets a bunch of spirits that are begging for his help. It goes very badly. <laughs> it is not fun for him. Um, but yeah, I love it. I'm proud of it. It's phenomenal. It is like absolutely breathtaking. And before we get into the book itself, I'm just, uh, I have a couple of comparative questions because I love how like writing experiences differ. But first off, like, how did you get so good at titling things? Because like both titles are are just rad. Like they're just really, really cool. (laughs) I mean... For Hell Followed With Us, we cycled through a bunch of different titles. Um, It went on submission as an overabundance of soul. Um, And we decided, you know, that that wasn't really going to work. So my editor and agent at the time uh, came together. We made a big old document where we would pull motifs from the book and phrases and stuff relating to it. And we ended up going through a bunch of Bible quotes, trying to find something. And I don't remember who suggested Hell Followed With Us because it wasn't me. Um, But I saw it and went, that's it. That's it. That's what we're going to call it. And thankfully, marketing and sales took a shine to it. Um, However, the spirit bears its teeth. Um, My fiance actually named it. Um, I was trying to come up with a title for it because the working title was The Violet Cage, and I didn't like that at all. It just wasn't wasn't what I was going for. It was a little too on the nose, um, and I was like, I need, I need a book title. And I had kind of come up with The Spirit Has Teeth, but there's also a book called The River Has Teeth by an author that I really look up to. Um, so I was like, that's not going to fly. My fiance was like, well, The Spirit Bears Its Teeth. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And then over the few weeks, I kind of fell in love with it. I'm like, they're absolutely correct. This needs to be the title. I pitched it to my editor and they were like, yeah, that's the title. That's exactly it. Nice. I love that they are team efforts. And, you know, like when you do hear the right title, it does kind of, you know, it clicks over time. Like titling things is really hard. So I'm just always like in admiration of when people land on really good titles. (laughs) Yeah, titles are difficult. (laughs) They are. And so are covers. And both your books have great covers, too. Um, I have two questions about that. One is, um, did the same artist do them? And two is, uh, like, what were your approaches to covers? Because they are sort of similar, but also sort of different. They're like heavily symbolic and very heavily staged. So could you talk about those two? Yeah, absolutely. So it is the same artist. Um, My artist is Evangeline Gallagher. I adore them. Um, when we did the first cover, I was given a list of possible illustrators by the designer, and I saw Evangeline Gallagher's name on there. I was like, I really love their work. However, I'm not going to like say anything because I'm just going to let the universe do what it does. You know, it's up to marketing and sales. They get to pick. And then we got Evangeline, and I was like, yes! <laughs> um, what we ended up doing um, for both of these books is we put together sort of like a sheet that we gave to the designer who would pass it along to the il- illustrator. So it would be a list of like, again, motifs, themes, images that we liked, um, possible covers that I really adored and wanted to see some elements of, um, elements that I didn't want to see. Um, I didn't want a title focused cover. Like I didn't want like fancy words. Like I wanted an illustration. So I was very straightforward about that. For my first book, it also included um, some excerpts from the book because the illustrators don't get to read the full book um, when they illustrate the cover. Yeah, I know that was 
<laughs> that was my thought. I was like, you mean they don't? Um, so we included two scenes that we thought might be, you know, important to helping to get the vibe. And that's what we did for Hell Followed With Us. For The Spirit Bears Its Teeth, I hadn't finished writing the book wow. before we needed to start doing cover stuff. Um, and I don't think the editor had actually seen the full manuscript yet. So my editor came to me and went, give me a list of stuff that you want and we'll figure it out. Um, so I gave about like half a page of images and stuff like that and went, will this work? And it turned out perfectly. Nice. Yeah. They're both so evocative. And I think that I love covers that like, um, you know, I don't want to get into details and spoil things, but I love covers that like mean more after you read them, you know, like that is, I think so, Oh, it's just a good touch and I really love it. So that they're both so well done. Um, I am curious about how maybe uh, the writing experiences may have differed um, given the different settings, because your first book is sort of like um, it's a post-apocalyptic, either like sort of present or very near future. And this one is a historical setting. So I'm wondering, um, do you have different processes in like building your setting and world building? Uh, or, you know, do you feel like you were drawing on the same kind of skills? Yeah. So for Hell Followed With Us, a lot of that was just like, what would be cool? Like, <laughs> what do I want to have happen? Right. Like, if you look over there and you see like a building that's collapsed and a bunch of other stuff, I'm like, yeah, I can do whatever I want. The city doesn't exist. Everything is in the future. I don't, I'm not beholden to any accuracies. Um, however, for the spirit bears its teeth, because unfortunately, London existed in 1883. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I had to be correct about things. So there was a lot of research, uh, which was fun because up until this point, the most research I had done on the Victorian era was my fiance talking at me about Bridgerton. <laughs> like that was that was all I had. So I was constantly um, going into Google Scholar to figure out what things were named because they had to, things change names over time. Like there's this one museum where it exists today, but it's an entirely different name. I had to figure out when certain rules were passed. I was constantly looking up um, the fluctuation of the British Empire to figure out which you know, territories were part of the empire at what given year, because it was constantly changing. Um, and it got to the point where we eventually hired a um, a queer historian mm -hmm. to fact check the book for me after edits. Um, it was honestly really funny. I got a 13 page document of everything I did right and everything they really needed me to fix. Um, and it turns out there were one or two massive anachronisms we couldn't change without breaking the book. And I had two weeks to fix it. So the official recommendation was just cover it up and explain it away, which I happily did. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's super cool. Like, um, where I'm curious about like um what working with a historian is like. Um, because before I kind of escaped to libraries, I was a, a historian of medieval Europe, so a different time period. Um, but I'm curious, I've always like really enjoyed um you know, the mixture of fiction and history and how that comes about, especially with like fantastical elements on top too. Um, like, so did you find that like working with a historian changed your perspective on other parts of the book too, or? That was actually a really big thing because I didn't know a lot about attitudes towards like gender in Victorian eras and especially um, like transgender identities or what we would call that now or drag or stuff like that. Um, I was not aware of a lot of that information, which kind of worked out because I know for a fact the main character would be completely unaware because the main <laughs> character is, com is completely unaware of a lot of things. Um, he is not very plugged into society. He just wants to deal with his internal organs. He doesn't really care about anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of fun stuff learning about how that was dealt with in theater and like the historical phenomenon of like female husbands. Um, but the main thing for this was I really wanted to get the small details correct so that the world felt more grounded when I went off left field with the speculative elements. So the historian was like, if you nail glove etiquette, the rest of it will feel more real, mm -hmm. um, which is weird because apparently glove etiquette changed every season. So he had to make sure it was like in the winter of 1883 what was it like? And I was like, how do you even begin to find that out? I cannot fathom. 
Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I love when like fiction, uh, like, I feel like, you know, I used to te- use fiction to teach history a lot because, you know, you could read a, a textbook and get the years and the names and like when the territories changed uh, hands and all that kind of stuff. But like fiction is kind of like a really good place to go for what the everyday experience of history would have been like, you know, for like the 99.9% of people that weren't generals and, you know, <laughs> and kings and stuff like that. Um, so speaking of history and the fantastical elements, um, I love, I love, love, love things that deal with um, like fantastical bureaucracies, but only when it's like super critical of the role of bureaucracy, you know, in maintaining uh, structures and inequalities and stuff like that. So could you talk a little bit about Braxton's finishing school and sanitarium and sort of like how you built the institution and the insidious ways and the not so like the hidden and the and the open ways in which it like polices and maintains uh various oppressive structures yes absolutely um so braxton's finishing school and sanatorium is a it pretends to be a finishing school for young women it is not that it essentially abuses them into the correct shape quote unquote for victorian marriage and they are um oh what is the correct word like um funded founded etc by the royal speaker society which is a group of violet-eyed men and non-violet-eyed men um that meddle in the affairs of spirits control who gets to do so control all the laws around it etc etc and i went into this book knowing that if there were supernatural powers in Victorian London, the first thing they would do is do a capitalism about it. There was no <laughs> no hesitation whatsoever. I knew that they would become insufferable, try to control it and make it like a state apparatus instead of letting it be something magical or miraculous. Immediately try to nail it down, control it, and control who gets to do it. Um, so of course that would affect all layers of society, but the one that I have the most experience with and have the, you know, lane to talk about um, is, you know, the treatment of people who were assigned female or um, eventually um, are seen as trans or that sort of thing. Um, that that w- That's my lane, so that's what I know how to talk about. And I was like, the way that they treated um, women and non uh, gender conforming people back then was absolutely atrocious. It was so bad. Um, and a lot of that is also based on stuff that kind of still happens today, like conversion therapy. And especially when we get to the way that disabled people are treated today with places like the Judge Rotenberg Center. Um, I was like, we're going to take the horrors of today and slam it into a historical setting just to see what happens, just to use the backdrop of how patriarchy was enforced then to play with how it feels now. Mm. Um, and that was, that's why the book is so upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a little too real. Yeah. Yeah. It is very visceral, um, both in um, the outer events, you know, that are depicted and in the internal experience of Silas. Um, he is such a, um, an observant, um, I was about to say observant observer. He is very <laughs> observant <laughs> about what is happening to him and how it's happening. And that makes it almost so much more, uh, Horrifying, yes, because he's so aware. Um, that does lead me to a question I had about writing Silas. And, you know, because both of your books feature um autistic trans young men, um, but in very different historical and sort of like uh political and social settings. Did you find that those different settings shaped how you approach their perspective, or were there more similarities than differences, if that makes sense? There are, yeah, so that played into a lot of it because both of the autistic characters in each of these books are based on versions of me or who I think I might have been in those situations. I mean, I'm, that's not to say I'm as cool as Nick from Hell Followed With Us. He is way cooler than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but little bits and pieces of myself were put into these characters in that way. Nick um, is in a situation where he knows what autism is. He is aware 
that he has a disability. He knows how to work with it. The people around him know how to help him with it. Um, so he is fully cognizant of what is going on and can work around it. Silas does not have that luxury. Um, the word autism wouldn't be coined for another 20 or 30 years, and it won't be used in the way that we know it now for another century. Um, so he has no sense of what is going on, only that he is different and the people around him tend not to like it. Um, on top of that, Nick, because he knows, can attempt to bridge gaps or in some cases mask it. He knows how to hide it, cover it up when he needs to. Silas does not have that either. Because I grew up learning to cover things up by like watching TV or reading books and mimicking that. And that was how I learned to hide the fact that people made no sense to me. Um, Silas does not have that. He has just had to wing it. Um, so he is far worse at hiding it because he didn't have the um, the resources that would allow him to do so. Not that hiding it is good. Yeah. But it is a survival tactic. Um, and Silas doesn't have the luxury of being able to hide it in a way that would make his life suck less. So I was like, what would I have been like if I hadn't been able to cover everything up for two decades? Mm, that is such an interesting point. And I never really thought about that like um, directly, like how the current media landscape does provide a lot more scripts for sort of like ways in order to like, Oh, slip into society, you know, in sort of more, uh, I guess, like covered ways, kind of like that's, that's a really, really great point. And it really does show too how having the language does really shape your experience, how language and also like the medical establishment, because that's a huge part here too. Um, like people tend to think that medicine or not anymore, really. But for a while, I think people saw medicine as like equalizing and perhaps liberating and like a, a net positive for society. And I think both uh, queer or, or queer trans and neurodiverse experiences all sort of like um, threaten that like medical kind of monopoly on maintaining uh, like the status quo. Could you talk about that too? Because like the way that medicine functions here is just so, it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the things that's really interesting for Silas is that eventually in a hundred years, medicine will have a word for what he is. And if he had that, it would have helped him. However, there is a really good chance that the medicalization and the diagnoses of autism would also not benefit him and also not be good in the same amount of ways. Because yes, it's good to know what you are, um, and it is extremely good to have the resources, but if the resources aren't particularly going to help you, and you still get, you know, if a doctor looks at your chart and sees autism, they're going to treat you differently. So a diagnosis would help him, but also given the situation that he's in, I guess we're all kind of glad that he doesn't have a definitive diagnosis because they would just use that as an excuse to hurt him more. So it's like the lesser of two evils. Society just kind of sucks when you're disabled and you have to figure out how it's going to suck. That's an excellent point. And that is something that does still feel very salient today too, because um, it for me, it resonates with my experience of college, you know, where I, like a diagnosis was like a real double-edged sword, you know, because like making that diagnosis public to the school would have given me access to a lot of more resources, but it also would have been like, a public event that would then, you know, then be on my record and be like, you know, just another kind of tool that can be used to identify you and put you into different slots, you know, where people want you to go. And so it is like a really, a very tricky thing. And this book like captures that nuance really well. Yeah, I love Silas. He's my baby. I, I'm very protective of him. Um, he's, he's just going through too much. <laughs> And you, do you feel protective of a character? Is it hard then to kind of do horrible things to them? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. Um, the, the terrible stuff is the fun part. Um, <laughs> especially, well, I have to say that my favorite thing to do with those characters that I feel protective of is have them do uncomfortable things to others. Like 
the C-section, you know. Um, once you read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. That scene is absolutely brutal. And it's not done on him. He does it to someone else. Um, but it's just, it's it's hard to sit through. <laughs> yeah, and, and like in a way, like that technique of having them, your main antagonist that you love, having them do uncomfortable things really does render them like a much more complete person. And I think that could be really important when we're talking about like queer and neurodiverse characters too, because I think that there can sometimes be this like impulse that like, if they're going to be representative of a community, they need to be like perfect, <laughs> you know, and then they don't, doesn't really let them be real people. So. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I talk about a lot was when I first came out as trans, I was really worried about respectability politics. I was stressed about it. Um, I ended up, you know, dropping a few characters that I was working with because I was like, oh, they're trans, but like they're mean or they're brutal and I don't want to represent that. Um, but these days I'm just like, yeah, that's <laughs> if a cis person is going to take issue with the trans community because of something I wrote, fine. <laughs> you know, they weren't going to like us anyway. I It's not my fault. I'm just I'm just being a horror author. I don't really know what to tell you. Um so having Silas like do like these really weird, uncomfortable, violent things means a lot to me. Um, and especially as I get into uh, writing my adult work, um, the <laughs> the lack of catering to non-trans and non-disabled people is just going through the roof. I'm having so much fun just being nasty. <laughs> That's exciting. All right. So that, does that mean that your next work is uh, for an adult audience? So my next book um, that comes out in 24 is actually another young adult book. Um, I've sold three through Peachtree Teen. Um, so th that one comes out in 24. Um, and that one is, um, so the working title is Compound Fracture. And it's about an autistic trans boy in West Virginia uh, the summer after the 2016 election, um, whose family is in a blood feud with the local sheriff since the time of the West Virginia Coal Wars. Um, and a miner who was uh, killed by strike breakers from that era comes back 100 years later and is like, I saved you from getting murdered by a bunch of your classmates. You need to end this blood feud. And if that means killing the sheriff's son, so be it. Um, and it's it's really messy. It's really violent. I have a lot of fun with it. Um, but my adult book that comes out in 25, um, it sold to Saga Press with Simon & Schuster. Um, is the current title is You Weren't Meant to Be Human. And it's about an autistic trans man who does not speak out of spite. He just doesn't want to. He doesn't like you. Um, who discovers that he's pregnant. Um, but his boyfriend, who is a terrible person, and the species of predatory alien worms they work for will not let him get rid of it. Um, so it is nine months of increasing paranoia and violence as he has to deal with what he's being put through. Um, and there are some scenes in that book that are disgusting. Every time I explain the ending to someone, they're like, what is wrong with you? So I'm really excited. Wow. Those both sound like absolutely like my jams. <laughs> and so I'm very, very excited for them. And I hope that uh, you'll consider coming back to the show to talk about one of them, because this has been a really lovely conversation. And, you know, I've enjoyed your work to date, and I am so excited to see what you do next. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. I will absolutely be back. I have a lot of fun doing these. Oh, great. Thank you. And thank you, listeners, for joining us. Um, I implore you, beg you, and command you even to pick up The Spirit Bears Its Teeth when you can. By the time that you hear this, uh, it will be out in the world. So go to your favorite independent bookstore or library, wherever you like to get your books. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.